we must escape the objectivist project of classical reason. In this episode of Philosophers Explained, we turn to Jacques Derrida, 1963 piece in which the postmodern thinker uh, takes on Michel Foucault's project of liberating or saving the insane from the dictatorial impositions of modern reason. Let's go to the text. I've highlighted the two main parts of the title, Cogito and the History of Madness. And from the history of philosophy, the Cogito is famous from René Descartes, his meditations and other works, Cogito Ergo Sum, a landmark formulation in modern philosophy. History of Madness, here referred to as Michel Foucault's book, which had been published in French. This is the English title, The History of Madness. Uh, And this lecture then turned into an essay by Derrida is meant as a follow-up reflection on Foucault reflecting on, in part, Descartes' meditations and the Cogito. So, plunging in, these reflections have as their point of departure, as the title of this lecture clearly indicates, Michel Foucault's book, and then in the next paragraph, Descartes' meditations. Now, we do have a Philosopher's Explained episode on Michel Foucault and his work, The History of Sexuality, an introduction. And we also have one on Rene Descartes' meditations. But just to rehearse on the meditations, in the first meditation, Descartes uh, uh, embarks on a highly skeptical project, and his project is uh, a hyperbolic skepticism, which is to say not necessarily meant to be believed, but as an exercise to see how far we can take skepticism, to see what can be doubted, Uh, even the tiniest possible shred of a doubt, and if it can be doubted, we're going to set it aside, because what we are looking for is a certain foundation for knowledge, and upon that certain foundation, then Descartes wants to build the rest of the edifice of knowledge. So we start with the series of skeptical arguments looking for a foundation, and Descartes asks, well, can I start with my senses? And he says, well, no, because sometimes my senses have deceived me, and that means at any given time my senses could be deceiving me. So, since that's not certain, I'm going to set aside sensory evidence as uncertain and not as the foundation of knowledge. Descartes also argues then that we sometimes dream, and when we are dreaming, we sometimes aren't aware that we are dreaming. We think that we are awake. And so we're not clear uh, uh, of the distinction between dreaming and waking while we are in that state. And then he asks, well, at this particular moment, is it possible that I could be dreaming and only thinking that I'm awake doing some philosophy right now? Well, it doesn't seem likely, but it's possible because I've been fooled in my dreams before. So I can't be sure and take it as a foundation that right now I'm actually aware of an external reality and not just a subjective projection in my in my mind. Can I be sure, even when I do mathematics and I'm thinking very carefully, uh, even perhaps in my dreams or if I'm awake, you know, that 2 plus 3 equals 5, and that I'm not making a mistake at that point? He says, well, it's possible that uh, there are evil geniuses out there. I know I can have this idea of a god who is good, but I can also have an idea of a god-like being that is also malicious, and maybe there's a malicious... Uh, God. I can't rule out the existence of that being, but part of his malice is that he likes to mess with my mind. And even when I'm thinking clearly and doing mathematics, I, uh, 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 I'm actually making mistakes because he's messing with my mind even when I don't think I'm making any mistakes. So can I even be certain about the truths of mathematics? And Descartes wants to say no. So I can't be sure that I'm uh, seeing the world as it is. I can't actually be sure that I'm seeing a world. I can't even be sure of the most clear-headed conceptions that are going in my mind. Maybe I just can't be sure of absolutely anything. But then Descartes in the second meditation wants to save the day by saying, in fact, there is one thing that I can be certain of, and that is that I think. And this is the cogito in the Latin. And uh, the idea here is that even if I am mistaken in what I'm thinking about, Uh, I still have to exist in order to be mistaken to think about that. Even if I'm being fooled by a genius, even if I think I am awake, even if I I think I'm seeing things as they really are, uh, even if I'm wrong in all of those cases, nonetheless, there's an I that's going through all of those processes, mistaken as they are. So I can be sure that I 
exist in the moment that I am engaging in these thoughts, even if they are wrong. So this is the passage in Descartes' Meditations that uh, uh, Foucault first and now Derrida wants to draw our attention to, because along the way, Foucault has a, sorry, a Derrida <laughs> notes that uh, Foucault also has noted that Descartes makes mention of the insane or crazy people in the first of Descartes' Meditations. In this passage, Madness, folly, dementia, insanity seem, I emphasize seem, dismissed, excluded, and ostracized from the circle of philosophical dignity. And so what uh, Foucault and Derrida notice here is that uh, Descartes is also making a distinction not only between uh, veridical perceptions and illusory perceptions, between dream states and waking states, between uh, actual clear rational thought and deluded rational thought. Uh, he's making a distinction between the rational and the crazy, or the sane and the insane. And at one point, Descartes says, there are some things that are just crazy, uh, and if I were to believe those things, I would have to be insane, but obviously I'm not, so I'm just going to set those aside. And so what we then have is uh, a criticism from Foucault, followed by Derrida, that Descartes is a little too hasty in setting aside the insane, assuming a kind of sanity uh, so that he can engage in his philosophical, rational process. So what uh, Foucault then does in his book is to say in writing A History of Madness, and now this is Derrida commenting on it, Foucault has attempted, and this is the greatest merit, but also the very infeasibility of his book, to write a history of madness itself, itself of madness itself. Notice how many times Derrida repeats that. So the idea here is that at the founding of modern philosophy, and uh, Google, uh, if you do Google searches or whatever your browser is, for the father of modern philosophy or the founder of modern philosophy, virtually all of them will say it is Rene Descartes and it is his foundational project of establishing reason that is taking modern philosophy in a brand new direction. And so the postmodern thinkers, Foucault and Derrida, are quite right then to say if we are going to attack modernity, modern philosophy, and say it has reached its end result, we need to become postmodern. Descartes, with his foundational project, certainly is the right one to focus on. So the idea here is that Descartes is establishing a distinction between the sane and the insane, between the rational and the crazy, and then more or less assuming a certain standard for what it is to be sane, for what it is to be rational, and then the modern project follows from that. But not so fast is what uh, Foucault and now Derrida are saying. Why don't we let, so to speak, the uh, madness into the game? Why don't we let craziness or insanity speak in its own voice? Why are we so quickly setting it aside as Descartes here seems to be doing? And so what would it look like if we were to then not write a history of reason or a history of modern philosophy in the Descartes fashion? What if we were to try to write a history of madness itself and let madness have its say, so to speak? And now Descartes then, uh, uh, sorry, Derrida at this point wants to uh, emphasize that this is something incredibly audacious and perhaps infeasible in its entirety, what Foucault wants to do. How would you write a history of madness itself? That is, madness speaking on the basis of its own experience and under its own authority and not emphasizing the not, a history of madness described from within the language of reason, the language of psychiatry on madness. And so he says uh, Foucault is quite rightly sensitive to this issue. A history of psychiatry Psychiatry, he, this is Derrida quoting Foucault directly, Foucault says, a history of not of psychiatry, Foucault says, but of madness itself in its most vibrant state before being captured by knowledge. 
It is therefore, now Derrida speaking for himself, it is therefore a question of escaping the trap of objectivist naivete. So objectivity and the assumption of objectivity or making objectivity axiomatic is naive. And for philosophers, of course, calling something naive is a grave insult. But here's what the project, the problem rather, would be with this project. <clears throat> that would consist in writing a history of untamed madness of madness as it carries itself and breathes before being caught and paralyzed in the nets of classical reason from within the very language of classical reason itself. And this is the problem because language, grammar, logic, semantics, syntax, all of those cognates, that entire apparatus has been captured by reason. Uh, uh, in the modern world, and it's only the language of reason from which we are allowed to speak. But what would it then mean to uh, speak in the in the uh, in the language of madness if all of language has already been co-opted by its adversary? Notice we have a problem then of the restrained and the restraining language of reason, so that already uh, in, in its very act, cognitively or epistemologically or linguistically, of assuming a monopoly over language, uh, 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 the, the, this modern project of reasoning is not allowing the mad into the game, so to speak. But then if we start to speak about the mad from the perspective of reason's language, then we are caught in the trap. And this is uh, uh, the, the, what both Foucault and Derrida then need to pay spare, spare, uh, special attention to. And Derrida points out that Foucault's determination to avoid this trap is constant. And then the question is going to be whether Foucault has gone far enough in avoiding this trap, in setting aside reason and its snares, uh, or whether at various points he has been captured himself and Fouc uh, Derrida is going to suggest that indeed Foucault has been so captured and so that one needs to be more radical. So sometimes, Derrida writes, Foucault globally rejects the language of reason, which itself is the language of order. That is to say, simultaneously, the language of the system of objectivity, of the universal rationality. And so this is the idea that reason is and should be universal, and that there's going to be a single system of language, and it will be an orderly system. We will define all of the rules of syntax and semantics, and this will enable us to mount the broader objectivist project of modern reason, modern science, modern philosophy, and so forth. And if we do all of that, if we, if, if we uh, let reason get away with that, then by definition and by, in point of fact rather, we relegate madness to silence. We take away any possibility that it can speak or write in its own name or in its own way. And then the, the problem then is that the history of madness itself is therefore an archaeology of silence. So then we have a, a kind of a value charged term. What reason does is stifles the mad. It stifles the speech of the insane because it co-ops any possibility of there being a language in which the insane and the mad could speak of themselves. Everything that has made madness and interrupted and forbidden that is arrested discourse, all these signs and documents are borrowed without exception from the juridical province of interdiction. And it's not only that philosophically uh, uh, reason takes away tools that the mad might use to speak in their own voice. Uh, philosophically, uh, the modern project justifies a certain kind of scientific enterprise, and that scientific enterprise includes psychiat psychiatry rather as a scientific discipline. And then the scientists also work uh, with the police and the courts to take the crazy people, the insane people, and to lock them away. Uh, so it's a double silencing by modern philosophy. 
And this is the problem. The psychiatrist is but the delegate of this order, one delegate among others. And so Derrida then goes on to say what our real and full target is. All our European languages, the language of everything that has participated from near or far in the adventure of Western reason. All this is the immense delegation of the project defined by Foucault under the rubric of the capture or objectification of madness. So it's not just you know, modern philosophy in the Cartesian sense now. We are generalizing all of the language projects of European philosophy and thinking. And then even more broadly, the entire uh, adventure of Western reason going back uh, to the Romans, going back to the Greeks, going back to the very beginnings of rational philosophy and the birth of philosophy by the ancient Greeks. That entire 2,500, 2,600 year history of reason in philosophy is now suspect. That's the enemy. That's what we need to go after. And then we start to introduce some normative language here. It's not just stifling. Nothing within this language, and no one among those who speak it can escape the historical guilt if there is one. Anybody in the entire tradition of Western philosophy who has signed on to reason, objectivity, is thereby guilty of this silencing of the crazy, silencing of the insane. And so those guilty people, those are precisely the ones Foucault wants to put on trial and Derrida wants to help and make sure that he does it uh, as consistently as possible. But here's again the problem. Such a trial may be impossible for by the simple fact that the articulation of the proceedings and the verdict unceasingly reiterate the crime. And that then is to say that we have to do analysis, we have to use reason, we have to use language. And uh, for the language to be communicatory, we need to use grammar that is universal so that we can all be talking on the same page. But if we are then going to put Western reason on trial, we have to use that very language that then is reiterating the very crime that we are trying to expose. So what do we need to do? Derrida. Total disengagement from the totality of the historical language responsible for the exile of madness. Liberation from this language. We have to somehow get outside of all language and all of the languages, particularly that have been captured and codified by any of the European languages at, the, at, a, at, a, at a minimum. So, and here's the problem, and if we are sympathetic to the insane, sympathetic to the mad, the misfortune of the mad, the interminable misfortune of their silence, is that their best spokesmen are those who betray them best, which is to say that when one attempts to convey their silence itself, one has already passed over to the side of the enemy. So the sane are the enemy of the insane. The rational are the enemy of the crazy. And if we are going to be sympathetic and on the side of those, we have to then attack the enemy, the side of order. And then here is a problem. There is no Trojan horse unconquerable by reason in general. There's no way, so to speak, to get out of this because reason has monopolized everything. The unsurpassable, unique, and imperial grandeur of the order of reason, that which makes it not just another actual order or structure, a determined historical structure, one structure among possible ones. It doesn't matter if you are a universalist or a relativist among languages here, is that one cannot speak out against it except by being for it, that one can protest it only from within it. And within its domain, reason leaves us only the recourse to stratagems and strategies. The reason, sorry, the revolution against reason, that's what we are going for, a revolution against reason. We can't step outside of language in order to attack 
reason from that outside perspective because uh, there's no language out there for which us to do so. Uh, what we then need to do is stay inside the language of reason, recognizing that we are engaging at least in the self-conflict, performative contradiction, but to use reason against itself from within reason. So we'll use all of reason's tools and formulations in order to subvert from within reason, since this outside of reason project seems to be impossible. The revolution against reason, Derrida goes on to say, can only be made within it. We have a necessity then of speaking which must escape the objectivist project of classical reason. Well, is this even possible? Can we escape objectivity? Can we escape classical reason? Can we get outside of it in some sense to liberate ourselves entirely, to go into the state of madness, to go into the state of insanity and see what emerges? And maybe it will come out in a fresh kind of language, or maybe it won't be a language at all, or maybe it will be something that's completely unrecognizable, but perhaps that's what we can uh, strive for. And again, Derrida quotes Foucault here, the liberty of madness can be understood only from high in the fortress that holds madness prisoner. So we imagine, uh, you know, like those fairy tales where the princess, right, or the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the king uh, who's been, uh, you know, captured by his rival and relegated to a high fortress and not allowed to, uh, allowed to speak with anyone, and of course, goes in crazy there, but we need to liberate that person from that fortress in which they are being held prisoner. If we can then liberate such craziness, such insanity, such madness, again quoting Foucault, Foucault speaks of a madness whose wild state can never be restored in and of itself and of an inaccessible primitive purity. So Derrida is saying that Foucault is skeptical that we can do this, but Derrida is not so Sure, possibly we can do so. So because this difficulty or this impossibility must reverberate within the language used to describe this history of madness, Foucault in effect acknowledges the necessity of maintaining his discourse within what he calls a relativity without recourse. That is to say, there is no way to get outside of uh, of, of one language scheme into another language scheme and say that this language scheme is better than this language scheme. Uh, if we are going to attack the universalizing, totalizing forms of language, the best that we possibly can do is some sort of relativity, but we're not going to get out of uh, relativity. It's a relativity without recourse, that is to say, without support from an absolute reason or Logos, a language declining in principle, if not in fact, to articulate itself along the lines of the syntax of reason. So the best that we can try to do is to go for another kind of language, but just uh, uh, not uh, let ourselves uh, be captured by the, the rules of syntax or the, the rules of grammar, so to speak. Feel welcome to violate those and perhaps that is going to enable us. But there is no way to get outside of language altogether. And this is now Derrida speaking in his own voice. The fact of language is probably the only fact ultimately to resist all parenthesization. And here we're talking about putting remarks in parentheses, but the idea here is that parentheses is nested within a broader framework. We can step outside of the parentheses and, and deal with whatever it is that we are dealing with outside of the parentheses. The parentheses is nested within. What Derrida is saying here is that language is something that we can never put inside parentheses and then look at language from outside, from a non-linguistic perspective. We are trapped, so to speak, inside language, and it's always some sort of language or other, we can never entirely get out of it. So, jumping back now then to Foucault, uh, sorry, to uh, Descartes and uh, the initial project here. <clears throat> the hypothesis of insanity at this moment of the Cartesian order seems neither to receive any privileged treatment nor to be submitted to any particular exclusion. So what Derrida is saying is that 
Descartes raises this issue of madness, but he does not spend time on it, and he does not deal with it in any sort of systematic way. It, uh, there's no argument so that leads to a particular exclusion to it, right? or it doesn't get privileged treatment, special treatment. Instead, he raises it and then very quickly just sets it aside and then goes on with his project of assuming sanity and reason and clearness and distinctness as our proper goals in thinking. And what Derrida then does is to say that this is something revelatory about Descartes' psychological state. He's not functioning as a real philosopher. He's not functioning as a true philosopher. Instead, what he's doing is what many people who are not philosophers do when they start getting into philosophy and all kinds of weird and strange ideas uh, come up. They get scared. And they start to run away, and they uh, they don't let themselves go in a certain direction because it's too disturbing for them. So what De uh, Derrida is doing is suggesting that Descartes is engaging in a similar maneuver. This setting aside of the insane, of the mad, does not express Descartes' final, definitive conclusions, but rather the astonishment and objections of the non-philosopher of the novice in philosophy who is frightened by this doubt and protests. Uh, it meets the resistance of the philosopher who does not have the, uh, sorry, the non-philosopher who does not have the audacity to follow the philosopher when the latter agrees that he might indeed be mad at the very moment in which he speaks. And so what Derrida is suggesting is that if we are going to be philosophers, we have to be willing to grant our own insanity. We have to be willing to let go of reason, let go of objectivity, let go of uh, the, uh, the self-protection that I'm not crazy, I'm not insane, and go into it. That then will possibly be liberatory. And here he wants to suggest that maybe Foucault is not quite uh, on the point here or on the mark here in going quite this far. That Foucault seems to be uh, more content with a relativizing move to another kind of language, perhaps. Any effort to reduce this project, to enclose it within a determined historical structure, to say, well, I'm not going to say that there's universal reason and universal language and universal uniform grammar and so forth. There are just languages. There are just knowledges. There are just different philosophies, and we just need to play them off against each other some determinate historical structure. We historicize or relativize it. However comprehensive, risks missing the essential, risks dulling the point itself. And he says this Foucault's book definitely demonstrates. Perhaps, there is a perhaps in there. But if it does so, then it risks doing it violence and in turn a violence of a totalitar totalitarian and historicist style which eludes meaning and the origin of meaning. So even if we are relativizing and getting away from uniform, it's just a matter of degree. We are still doing violence. We are still totalitarian. And notice this very strong language here that in effect then Descartes, the entire project of modern philosophy, all of the European languages, perhaps the entire project of Western reason is totalitarian, and it is that thing that we need to strike, destroy, and try to get past all together. This is a form of violence making possible all straitjackets, and there's not just philosophical theory again. The straitjacket reference is what do we do with the crazy people? We put them in institutions, we lock them away, we put them in physical straitjackets, uh, allegedly so that they can't harm themselves and other periods. But that is the most totalitarian result of totalitarian philosophy based on a certain assumption of reason and objectivity. Philosophy seems to live only by imprisoning madness, but which would die as thought and by a still worse violence if a new speech did not at every instant liberate previous madness while enclosing within itself in its present existence the madness of the madman rather of the day it is only by virtue of this oppression of madness that finite thought that is to say 
history can reign. So that is to say, philosophy, as we conceive of philosophy, has only ever been done by doing violence to the man, by imprisoning it and not allowing it to be liberating. Now, Derrida then goes on to argue this is disturbing, this is unsettling, the idea that you might be insane, the idea that you have to let yourself go into the insanity, that you have to try with all of your uh, uh, resources to subvert reason, objectivity, and so forth, that does invoke in one a terror. But that's what the genuine philosopher will do. Final line, I philosophize only in terror, but in the confessed terror of going mad.